Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about one of our latest expeditions, which are all the trials and tribulations. It was actually one of the hardest trips we ever did, but also one of the most satisfying. And these guys will tell you about all the things we went through. Um, this is Dave Gruber. He, I'm, well, I should say, I'm John Sparks. I'm the curator of ichthyology here at the museum. This is Dave Gruber. He's a research associate at the museum and an associate professor at uh, City University. This is Dr. Vincent Pierbone. He's a, also a research associate at the uh, American Museum, and he's at Yale University at the J.B. Pierce Lab, and he's a neurobiologist. We're going to talk about a trip we went on. This is a couple of us in a sub that, um, on that trip, and this was to the Solomon Islands this last summer. And we're going to kind of go through how we built up to this expedition. A lot, about a year's worth of, of making equipment, designing it. We did, had to design a lot of it from the ground up. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the expedition itself um, and some of the major findings um, that we've been able to um, c come up with and publish since then. And then some of the applications, downstream applications of, of the work we're doing. We all kind of came together, I would say somewhat accidentally. I went down to help um, Dave image some... Uh, corals on Bloody Bay Wall, which is a beautiful coral reef off a of little Cayman Island. And we were down with this photographer, this is Jim Hellman, um, using really big rigs to take images of huge sections of the reef. And then we wanted to go back at night, stitch these together, and look at biofluorescence on the reef as well as a daylight image, make these really large composite images. And, you know, we take big images, look at them at night, and you see these really fantastic corals that come out. And this is due to a process called biofluorescence. We'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. And they give off these really amazing colors. So this is all color due to biofluorescence. So they'd be completely black out. We shine bright lights at them to stimulate either sunlight or really a bright moonlit night. And we get these really interesting colors back. The photographer took this image. This is an octopus here. And this little guy crept into the picture. This is a very tiny eel that, you, that actually people never, ever see unless they collect um, in certain ways where you can get fish out of crevices. They hide during the day, and they only come out at night. It's called a false moray or a clopsid eel. And it was glowing bright green, and we thought this was just a joke. He'd photoshopped this in. But in fact, he told us, no, I didn't. This, this, was, this image was really in there. And it got us thinking more about, wow, how widespread is biofluorescence in the marine environment? And then we went back to look for some of these eels in the Bahamas, did a couple trips down there, and we found a bunch of them. And in fact, they were glowing. And these fish today are still about the brightest fish we've ever found. They, in fact, they, they produce so much protein, they glow throughout their whole body. If you were to cut the seal in half, it's bright green throughout the whole body. So I'm going to pass it over to, to Dave now to talk a little bit about biofluorescence. Okay, so the reason we're interested in, um, in biofluorescence in the environment is the ocean is primarily a blue environment um, due to the spectral properties of water. And this is a phenomena where if the blue light comes in, it gets absorbed by these objects on the reef. This is a, a very non-common uh, phenomena on the terrestrial, but it's, it's quite common on coral reefs the energy gets absorbed, and then it comes back out as slightly lesser energy, which would be green and red lights. So the fish, instead of living in this nice, you know, pan-spectral world, they live in this universe with, um, with just very few colors. And as you get deeper and deeper until you get no light whatsoever, um, it's mainly blue. Biofluorescence comes together with another process called bioluminescence in this jellyfish. This was an animal that in the 1960s, some scientists were studying off of the coast of uh, Friday Harbor, Washington. While they were studying this, they noticed that the animal actually gives off a green um, bioluminescence, but when they were able to purify the animal, it was actually blue. So there was this mystery on why the pure luminescent protein was, was blue, and yet the animal is green. Okay, so bioluminescence is a little bit different. So for biofluorescence, you need an external input of energy, the sunlight or the moon, as we said. It excites molecules, which then give off light in a longer wavelength. You lose some energy. You get blue light in, you get longer wavelengths back, the greens, the reds, oranges, and yellows. Bioluminescence, on the other hand, is a chemical reaction that takes place within a living organism. And this thing here is a little female anglerfish we collected um, this fall in the Solomon Islands. Um, it's about two or three inches long. It's, a, it's an adult. That's a lure there, and these guys actually use bacterial bioluminescence. So in this lure, they bring in colonies of bacteria, grow the bacteria up, and the bacteria produce the light. Other fish produce it themselves. They get certain chemicals through their diet, they mix it together in, in structures called photophores, and produce light. So bioluminescence is, is very important in the deep sea. It's a huge environment. Most of the sea is, is dark, it's a vast environment, and it's a great um, kind of environment for bioluminescence to evolve. 
and they're thought to be these, these you know, extremely terrifying creatures, but actually the, they, this is a big one. A big one would be about an inch and a half, two inches long. They're very menacing to smaller critters in the deep sea, but by themselves, not very menacing. Whenever I teach this in class, um, usually this is, uh, people are like, what is bioluminescence? And then you're like, you know, finding Nemo, and uh, that gets a quick response. Yeah, and that's, and that's the female. If you look at that, the, the, uh, the females look like this here. The males are very tiny, degenerate little organisms that with big eyes and big... <laughs> and big olfactory senses. So what they do is they attach to a female if they find her of the same species and basically become an attached gonad. They, they dissolve a lot of their bodily structures, become attached to her, so she, she has a ready mate for the rest of her life. And sometimes you find multiple mates on a single female. Bioluminescence is used for a, a number of functions we know about it. They use, organisms use it for camouflage. They use it to avoid predators by trying to do flashes to, to confuse a predator. They use it to attract prey. They use it for... Um, prey detection to, to stimulate, they hold a lure out, dangle it as a light, and they also use it for communication, just as we see in fireflies. Very elaborate systems of communication are used in fishes. So, want to pass it over for sure. equipment design? You can do this one? Like sure, this. sure. So, now we're thinking about how do we study this phenomena of biofluorescence in the ocean, and we needed to make this very high intensity um, blue light system, and uh, we actually have some of the designers here in the, in the audience with us that helped us make these at the uh, John B. Pierce Laboratory. We essentially take like several dive flashlights, and these are producing a very pure blue light. Um, and then from that, we put this through another filter um, that would go over the front here. And our first generation of how we did this, we actually used motorcycle batteries because we needed something very powerful to power these lights, um, each one being about eight lights, and we, we kind of rigged these together. But now the, the expedition was coming up rather quickly, and um, we only had a few days left, so we didn't do much work in terms of putting buoyancy on this. And then we head off on an expedition to the Solomon Islands, and we did this first expedition in 2012, thanks to the National Geographic weight grant, and we, we head out to the Coral Triangle, which for us is one of the richest biodiverse marine systems. And um, we went to some rather, rather remote places. Um, there was, there was, we were some of the only scuba divers within, within maybe 100 miles around. And um, we, had, uh, we found the one compressor, um, filled up tanks for us. And we headed out there now with these high intensity um, blue lights ready for testing. So here is Vincent. Um, handing down the, the lights that are on motorcycle batteries. And we're now at a place called Shark Point, um, one of our first dives, and we quickly realized why it's called Shark Point. Um, and here we are testing this. And I, I called a couple shark researchers before, and I said, you know, what, what do you think blue light will do to shark behavior? And they were like, I don't know, nobody ever swims around at night with blue lights. So, you know, you're on your own, buddy. But we go down, and we had a, another diver, and we also had um, a underwater photographer also with National Geographic who had done a lot of the Shark Week specials, so, so that, was, uh, that was nice. And the three of us are swimming in tandem um, with these motorcycle batteries, trying not to get tangled up as, we, as we, sh we shine light across the reef. And this is what it would look like if we were just looking at it a day um, without stimulating this biofluorescent properties. And this is what it looks like at night. This, is what it, this would normally look black, but we're now looking at the blue light that's getting absorbed and reflected back out. Adding now to the eel that we had found, we started to see other fish that were fluorescing. Um, so this is a, a scorpion fish that was on, on this rock here. Um, fluorescing red as well as the chlorophyll also fluoresces red, as well as this bream, which had a nice little green fluorescent racing stripe down its, down its nape, and it's hanging out here in this uh, um, coral patch that's also fluorescing green. So this took us back, to, we went back this um, last fall to the Solomons to kind of further this work and, and use, go to deeper water. We wanted to, to test cameras and, and build cameras that could go deeper on a, on a submersible. And this was a submersible, it's called a Triton 3300. It can go to 1,000 meters. So it's plenty deep for us to get down and, and study um, both bioluminescence and biofluorescence. And we built special lights for it um, that were mounted on the front. Vincent, why don't you talk a little bit about yeah. the lights? So, so we, generation two of these had to go much deeper. So we did a bunch of design around building these. And 
they look like they're blue lights, but they're actually spectrally extremely pure blue light. And on, only with very pure spectral blue light do you get this effect. So we, we have to sort of reinvent ourselves and create, these are actually the pre lamps that are in projectors, like the kind of projector that's here, or the kind you go to see an IMAX film in, in digital. Those are using RGB uh, LEDs, and those LEDs we took out of those machines and put them inside these heads, and then built very powerful power sources and a special lamp system that allowed to give us this very spectrally pure light that came out. And we attached these on a rail. Then we have two very sensitive low light cameras here with filters on the front that allow us to see this effect. So we're trying to see, does this effect exist in the deep ocean? You could notice that we, we put all this energy onto the imaging, but we have a $5 bucket um, yeah, that we're using to collect, and collect stuff. With. Yeah, we ran out of money. <laughs> and uh, as, as Dave said, we did a lot of work and had like five divers, but on the first trip, but the second trip, we managed to miniaturize the batteries and everything and have these lights on the, on the scuba divers be very tiny. Yeah. And we could swim around and film with it. So that's sort of us, it's hard to see it, but from our angle here, anyways, us swimming around and it looks like just blue light, but when you have yellow sunglasses on, it's an absolutely phenomenal. Even the pictures that we show here really don't do justice to how beautiful things look. So this is what it looks like to your eyes as you swim around. So this unreal world of everything in here should be black. Anywhere there's black is something that's rock or non-living, and it doesn't re return anything. So you can imagine the scene without the glasses is this bright blue light, but inside these organisms are these special proteins that return back this other wavelength of light. And we did both shallow water and deep collecting. And for the shallow, we're here um, collecting fish for biofluorescence imaging. And this is a shallow reef in the Solomon Islands, incredibly beautiful. And when we go for deeper fish, we use something like this. This is called an Isaac's Kid Midwater Trawl. And this thing can go you know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 meters. And we got it down pretty far with, with Brennan's help on a very tricky winch we had. We had a lot of problems with it, but it worked. And we got a lot of very cool fish. Lots of different things come up in a trawl. So it's very interesting. It's like a, you know, a moment of discovery. Everybody runs out and looks to see what's brought up in the, in the cod end. And you can see some of these fish, come, it's rare, but come up alive. This is a lantern fish alive. There's a couple of them in here still alive. And what is really tough for us is to image these things when they're still alive to study their flashing patterns. We can look at the side of them and tell how we think they might flash, but we don't know really how they flash. And that's where the exosuit comes in, um, which you may have heard about earlier, which you can see um, behind you after, after the talk. And what we find, w w one of the big unanswered questions about the deep ocean is how do fish or other organisms speciate? How do they turn to different species when you've got an open environment with no obvious barriers to reproduction? And that's what we're very interested in. Certain groups are very diverse, others aren't. Others, you only find a few species. And what we notice is two groups, one group of dragonfish, these are these really bizarre fish with dagger-like teeth, a lot of them have very elongate chin barbels, and another group called lanternfish, probably the most abundant vertebrates on the face of the earth, have become very diverse. And why do they do that? These are light organs on their side. We've studied these patterns of, pho they're called photophores, and this is where the light comes out. And the fish that actually have unique patterns of photophores on their side seem to be diversifying faster than those that only have this ventral series of photophores. And ventral bioluminescence is thought to be for counter-illumination against predators lurking below. So what these fish will do is they'll match the downwelling light, like you see through the, the roof here kind of, they'll match that and disappear to any predator lurking below. And what we find is if we look at kind of in, in morphometric space, we can identify these species strictly based on their photophore patterns. And as I mentioned, the groups that have unique photophore patterns are more diverse. We find the same thing for these dragonfish that have these lures here hanging off their chin. And these are luminescent, they light up. And each species can pretty much be identified by the type of lure it has. So again, another group that's diversified. And we find they're more diverse simply because these photophores have kind of migrated up the side of the fish and they give off unique signals. So one of the things we're really lacking now is actual flashing patterns. We can do this based strictly on the anatomy we observe under a microscope, but we want to record the flashing patterns again. And that's what we're kind of trying to get to, build these cameras that can get down and capture flashing patterns. So starting with that initial discovery of the, of the eel, um, we hadn't known much of um, fluorescence in fish. There was just a few, you know, very scattered reports. And from this trip, from these two trips to the Solomon Island, we put together um, a paper that described 180 new species of um, biofluorescent fish. And this is probably still even among the, we probably scanned over thousands of them. So this isn't a very common phenomena among fish, but we found it all over the place. We found it in flatheads, different patterns, lizard fish. And what we started to notice is that this was in more of the cryptic fish, the fish that you don't normally see when you're out on the reef. These are the fish that are, that are hidden. And what we're probably seeing here is, is that 
Some of these also come out to mate on the, on the full moons. So the full moon would translate into a, um, with the light would hit the water and that light would translate into blue light underwater. And they also, some of these have yellow filters in their eyes. So they would be able to almost do exactly what we were doing. They're absorbing this blue light, re-emitting it, and they have the filtering apparatus in their eyes to possibly be able to see this. So this was a super exciting finding for us, um, seeing that this, the diversity of biofluorescent across the tree of bony fish. So you could see here, it's in the lizard fish and the gobies and the blennies and the fat fish and the scorpion fish. Um, it's grouping together and it's uh, common in the cryptically patterned fishes. Sure, so as I say, what's really interesting about this, like just talking about bioluminescence, how you can tell the fish apart by the patterns they give off of, of their light. You can do the same thing with bio, biofluorescence. And this is just a group of lizard fish. They're two very close related species that even people who work on the group have a really hard time telling apart. If we look at them under white light, they look pretty much the same. You put them under fluorescent light, and this is a ventral view, and they, and they look star, you know, strikingly different, much more than they do under, under white light. And, we're, and we find that for a lot of different groups. We think they're also potentially using it for camouflage. We find groups like this red scorpion fish we showed you a video of. It tends to hot, hang out on red corals, red sponges, red algae-covered rocks. And this bream, which is found around these, these bright green corals, and as Dave mentioned, these fish, a lot of these fish that are fluorescent already have this yellow filter built in their eyes. So they have a built-in, essentially long-pass filter that cuts out the blue light that's all around them and will allow them to see these longer wavelengths here in the visible spectrum. Some, some of the things that beforehand, um, this was common, we first discovered in the jellyfish in the 60s. Jellyfish are related to corals. We found it to be really ubiquitous in corals. There had been a lot of studies, but there had been few studies beyond this. Um, so on this trip, we found it in over 180 species. Now we're up to over 200 species of new fish. We found it in crinoids. On one of the trips in the, um, down in the submarine, we actually found it in a, in a soft coral down to 120 meter meters. We reached out and grabbed it, and uh, we have it frozen here in the laboratory. We found it in the seahorse, um, Hippocampus uh, erectus here. And the red on the outside is actually algae um, that it, it has in, um, on the outside of its skin, but it's got these green fluorescent eyes. And these seahorses are known to have uh, really good vision. And normally, if they're hanging out in grass, in seagrass, that grass would also be fluorescing red, so they would blend perfectly in um, and be able to possibly identify each other. We also found this in stingrays, and it kind of opened up a question, um, if it's in the cartilaginous fish, that maybe it would also be in sharks. So we began um, thinking of ways to um, as we're down in the Solomon Islands, of how to kind of you know, start filming these sharks during the day and then how we'd get these sharks close enough at night that we could uh, quick get them close so we could do a quick little scan to see if they're fluorescent or not. Um, so, of course, the guy from Shark Week nominated me to, to put some dead fish in my scuba BC, which I wasn't... I, I, at this point, I realized maybe I need a new job. Um, but eventually, we did find it. Um, so we're now showing you possibly the, you know, some of the, the first imageries of uh, shark fluorescent that, that, have been, that have been recorded. There's another group in, in um, 2005 that had seen it but didn't get any images. Here's two of them together. And sort of this shark during the day, I mean, and under daylight, looks like a kind of boring brown shark, but under fluorescent lights, it's this weird... Yeah, this is the first, the first video that of, of this... Of, biofluorescent sharks that, that, that have been taken. Yeah. Lights and are kind of shaking. And, and what's interesting about them is these are very common sharks. These are cat sharks, both these. This is a, a deeper water version of a cat shark. The other one was a swell shark, which is common you know, in the surf off of California, uh, the coast. So it's odd that they were never found before, but no one's really gone out and looked. So what's next? You know, we're always kind of thinking, um, now that we've, we've, we've got the shark fluorescence, um, and we've, we were able to commandeer uh, this submarine, and we were able to convince the owner to allow us to penetrate the submarine, which is a big kind of ask, I think, to ask of when you're borrowing somebody's uh, submarine, but to be able to get the fiber optics so we could hook up our low light camera so we could record this, so we could look at the biofluorescence deep, which brings us to the exosuit um, and into the new era of exploration. And we're thinking about atmospheric diving suits and how people have gone about in the past to, to get themselves underwater for long periods of time so they can get down there and do stuff and do some work and interact. And atmospheric is the concept that you take the atmosphere around you and bring it underwater so you're not, you're not experiencing the pressure effects of being underwater. So these are early versions of the, the suit that's the real life one which is brought to us by the white construction company sitting in the back there. These are the earlier versions of these that have been used for years 
not so much scientifically, but more for the idea of this exosuit trip, which we talked about and which is on display for the last time tonight here at, at the museum, is that all, every time we go down into these depths, either shallow diving, which we do to sort of two, three hundred feet, um, we have to come up quickly because of the effects of pressure and the danger of it. But this suit gives us the, and then we go down in submarines, but then you have no access to the world. You just get to sit there and watch a movie as things float by and you say, oh, that would be nice if we could collect that. Oh, that would be nice if we could collect that. <laughs> and it's frustrating to be completely blunt. So, so just by chance, we were offered the chance after meeting these, these fine gentlemen that the, use this in construction work, that they would allow us to take this out into the ocean and do some exploration and science with the suit. So in July, we plan to take this suit out, as well as the ROV that's down there, into around 1,000 feet of water and collect bioluminescent and fluorescent organisms at night in the dark uh, and photograph them, as, as John said, hopefully for the first time in their natural environment rather than sort of having to drag them up in nets and things like that. So somebody, some lucky soul, gets to plop into the suit and <laughs> go down to the depth and uh, actually manipulate equipment and meet up with the ROV down there and sample and look at stuff. Stay tuned. In July, we'll, some of us, hopefully, will get down in that suit to yeah. go down and look to collect things. Um, what I wanted to talk about the last thing is why a neuroscientist is sitting up here on the stage. Because all of what we've talked about, about these fluorescent and glowing corals, sounds like really cool stuff. But for neuroscientists, this is more than cool stuff. It's actually essential to the kind of science that we do today in the modern world. These proteins that we talk about that are in these corals and discovered in this jellyfish have, and without, without exaggeration, revolutionized our entire science. We've taken the DNA from one of those fluorescent proteins from those animals and taken that DNA and put it into this cell and tagged it onto a protein, a protein that has rem remained invisible ever since scientists have looked at it. And tubulin, uh, which is essential to all cells functional, from bacteria all the way to humans, uh, is for the first time able to be revealed by using these proteins out of the deep sea ocean. So these, these this green protein taken from the jellyfish that Dave mentioned early on, we've now extracted them from these corals and even the fish that we talked about here. We take the DNA out of one of the animals, we clone the proteins out of it, we put those proteins into cells, mice, monkeys, anything you want, and they glow green like this. Uh, we, we pulled out well, the brightest protein ever found uh, in a paper that we published recently from this, this really un, unassuming little coral that we found in the Caribbean. 1.3 meters, which is a, a bit embarrassing. Very shallow, yeah. Um, <laughs> This is an example of taking one of these proteins. This is, this is a single nerve cell in the brain of a mouse two, with, labeled with two different proteins, one protein which is blue and one protein which is green. And each one of these is about 10 microns, which is 10 thousandths, uh, uh, 10 thousandths of a millimeter, so very tiny. You're able to actually see and identify cells which are otherwise completely clear. This is a picture of an Alzheimer plaque in a living mouse that actually my wife took. This is a photograph from a living mouse on day one after it begins to build a plaque. This is an Alzheimer plaque. This is Alzheimer, uh, uh, an A-beta protein, amyloid protein, in day one and day 30 in a living animal. This little fiber here is one micron, which is one thousandth of an, an inch, and one thousandth of a millimeter, excuse me, so extremely tiny. And what you're seeing is, is this plaque form over time and destroy these healthy fibers. These nice little fine ones are healthy fibers and these swollen ones are dying fibers. And this is the process which is involved to produce um, Alzheimer's disease. So we can actually use these proteins that you've been looking at all these beautiful pictures, the DNA for those, put them into nerve cells, and use cameras to image electrical activity in cells. So we're using these to see actually which cells in a particular field. Normally we go in with a tiny little electrode and record which one of these cells is activated. So we can actually determine which cells in the brains are firing. We can convert this information into understanding how the brain's electrical activity is producing behavior. So this is the future. That's the reason I myself am out there searching around for all these kind of proteins because we clone them and purify them, bring them back, and use them for study and, and biomedical research. I think that's it. Am I right? Thank you guys very much for listening to us. Appreciate it.